Are you enjoying watching the series on YouTube? If so, please consider also following me on Instagram, where I'm currently uploading behind the scenes photos from my time unicycling across the States. Okay, on with the video. Last time, I had a quick stop off at unicycle.com's HQ to bodge together a new saddle. I've been struggling with nasty saddle sores for months and thought that a new air seat may well be the solution. With my new saddle installed, I hit the road once more in the direction of Charlotte, North Carolina. Waiting for me there was a guy called Carrie Gray, who four years prior made my original pair of unicycle panniers. As you can imagine, I was pretty excited to finally meet him, but with 250 miles between me and Charlotte, there was still plenty of time before then to get distracted. I'm riding on a one-man wheel car, Chris and Bill, analog, 36-inch unicycle across the U.S.A. I don't know what the hell I'm gonna get myself into, do, yeah. My name's Ed, and I'm riding a unicycle around the world. Join me on this series as I attempt to cycle 4,000 miles across the United States of America. Riding through Georgia's woodlands was quite simply stunning. My day seemed to consist of gorgeous forest roads followed by picturesque river crossings. I managed to navigate on smaller roads and most of the time found myself pedalling through endless tunnels of trees, some of which I also flew the drone through. Since swapping my saddle, I was no longer in any pain and I was quite honestly just really enjoying being out here. It was a bit of a bodge, a little bit of duct tape and, and what have you. But I'll tell you what, this new saddle is the most comfortable one I have ever ridden on on this whole trip. So fingers crossed it will continue. But that's a big thumbs up for the air saddle. The one drawback of riding through this lush vegetation was the unbearable humidity. One of the reasons I started heading south all the way back in Texas was to escape the chillier weather. What I stupidly forgot to consider was that this decision would ultimately force me to ride through the southern states in summer. <sighs> I'd experienced dire humidity many times before, most severely in Southeast Asia, so I knew my body didn't cope well with it. Oh, oh, fuck. Oh. It was now June in South Carolina, and I was really suffering. How do I look? I'm guessing not great. Oh my, I just crossed into South Carolina, but I don't much care about that. I'm feeling a bit sick. Um, I looked at the forecast this morning and it is 100% humidity and 30 degrees Celsius. And I've, I've got no energy, I've got nothing to give. I feel like riding today is like the equivalent of trying to run in a swimming pool. It's, uh, you know, you put as much effort in as you can but you just don't go that fast. And I'm covered in water. <laughs> oh my. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna need to focus. Oh my, oh my stomach. I feel like I might be sick. This is really not good. This is not good at all. Oh. Ah. Ah, I think I'm pushing far too hard. I've drunk like two litres of water, had a little bit of a lie down. I'm feeling a lot better now. Um, I don't know what that stomach pain was, but I need to keep an eye on that. Um, I want to do another 20 miles today. And then later, a guy called Eddie is going to pick me up and drive me back to his home. And then tomorrow morning, he'll then drive me back to the point where he picked me up. Uh, but I need to make another 20 miles. So let's, uh, let's do this. I put this freak sickness down to dehydration. And even though I certainly wasn't 100%, after downing some water, I felt strong enough to continue. So tentatively, pedaled onwards. 10 miles down the road, I faced a very different problem. Oh no! Oh no! Oh bollocks! <laughs> Do you see that big black cloud behind me? I think pretty soon I might be getting wet. I soon came across a bungalow and decided to knock on its door and ask if I could take shelter. I met the lovely Steve and Karen, who happily invited me in out of the downpour. It turned out that Steve had had a lot of experience cycling himself. Before retiring, he'd been part of a bicycle unit in the police force. Curb hopping, man, I love that. I was just, you know, wide open and I'll sit at the last second, you know, do a little bounce yeah, pull. Yeah, yeah. And 
and the guys in the patrol cars, man, how the heck did y'all get here before we did, you know, and all that. And I said, because I don't have to do all this. I can go straight through there as long as I can get through the neighborhood. Soon, Eddie and his mate Chris arrived. How's it going? It's going. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Finally. So I said goodbye to Steve and Karen and headed off back to Eddie's place. They lived and studied at Clemson University, about 40 miles up the road. That night, they were keen to take me to see the campus's famous bell tower. <laughs> You're on the spot. How far can this be held? Across campus. Yeah, we're, yeah. Getting, we're getting yeah. in trouble. Yeah. What do you call this instrument? This is a carillon. And where do you learn to play? It's a very big one. Uh, they offer a class here at Clemson that you can come up here and learn to play it. Would you like to go see the actual bells themselves? I want to play it first. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Come here. Yeah, yeah. That bell right there has a four and a half ton bell. Wow. What time is it, Chris? Two, <laughs> three, seven, eight, nine. Eight, nine. Now do a really small one for 30 minutes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, Eddie and Chris kindly drove me back, and after thanking them, I hit the road once more, feeling refreshed and excited about the miles to come. I eventually reached the outskirts of Charlotte and had just 20 miles to pedal until its centre. This is where I'll be meeting fellow unicyclist Carrie Gray, but there was one person I was keen to meet first. Well, I'm uh, just Dr. Randy Conger. Um, I'm a sports a chiropractic physician, South Carolina, down here in TKK. I'd met his daughter Courtney back in Clemson, and he kindly got in touch to offer his services at his clinic. He certainly didn't hold back. <laughs> oh. Oh. All right, bud, you've been adjusted. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Randy. My pleasure, absolutely. Randy did an incredible job, and I left TKK feeling loosened up and ready to push out the final few miles to the centre of Charlotte. Thank you everyone for supporting what I do on Patreon. It really does allow me to keep doing what I'm doing. And I really hope you're enjoying watching these videos a week early. And of course, I want to say an extra, extra, extra special thank you to Adam Fink, Adam Stevens, Alex Brito, Alex Lee, Annabelle Miley, Anson Liang, Axel Fontaine, IP, Carrie Clellans, Damon Walker, Daniel Brum, Daniel Silas, David Jolliffe, Derek Donovan, uh, Elijah Green, Elijah Legenda, Gaia de Navaya, Justin Lewis, Jeff, Jeff and Kelly Elder, Jessasin, Justin, Jared and Arsh, uh, Kentaro Sakino, Kiki Tedger, the Madston Brothers, Malvin Zen, Mario Yegas, Mark Paris, Mike Foxwell, Philip Merritt, Rocky Top, Sam Richardson, Samuel Rook, Sophie Vun, Stephen Jones, Sumi Lemours. Let's get over this bump. Whoop! Uh, where were we? Neil Brooks, Tommy Nurmajavi, Travis Kay, Tristan Smith, and Warren Snyder. Thank you very much. Now back to the video. You gotta wait for the right truck. It's just like surfing. <laughs> you gotta wait for the right wind. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. This is Carrie Gray. Carrie Unicycles. A lot. About 20,000 miles so far, travelling self-supported through North, Central and South America. His past rides have been absolutely epic, pushing crazy mileages each day through extremely challenging landscapes. We're doing triple digit mileage in triple digit heat! Woo! I love Texas! 
He also played a major role in the preparation stage of my own ride. Here's a quick side-by-side -side of Carrie's unicycle touring setup and my unicycle touring setup. There's a reason they look so similar. Back in 2014, when I was planning my ride, I came across a section on Carrie's website stating that he may be able to build to order a custom set of unicycle panniers. I pinged him a message, paid him some money, and about three weeks later, two blue bags arrived in the post. I believe these panniers were the first real purchase I made towards my trip, and they were absolutely key to helping me build out my rig and getting the whole entire World Unicycle Tour off the ground. We'd only ever emailed, so as someone so instrumental to my last three years, and as the only other person on the planet to have unicycled the same distance, I was extremely excited to finally meet him in North Carolina. Unfortunately, Carrie was out of town the day I turned up in Charlotte, but was set to arrive later that night. I caught up with him the next morning, buzzing to learn more about his own experience traveling by unicycle. I started in Baltimore where I was living um, five years ago, and I went uh, up to Canada, down and across the US, and down and across Mexico, Central America, to Colombia. And the original plan was to go to Tierra del Fuego at the southern tip of South America. But in Colombia, after being in South America only a couple weeks, I got my passport stolen. So came back to the US. Um, I'm from St. Louis, Missouri. So I stayed there for a bit. And then I went from there, the middle of the US, up northwest through the northwestern states, up through BC in November in 2014 to Alaska. I've been going since 2.30 in the morning. And we just went through about three hours of snow. And in 2016, I went down the coast, down to Santa Cruz. And then the beginning of last year, 2017, I went from Santa Cruz um, over the Sierra Nevadas to through Death Valley Woo! to Las Vegas. Uh, and then last year, the original plan was to go down to Florida and go back to South America, of course, but uh, that didn't work out. So I went, I came down through North Carolina, went all the way across North Carolina and um, stopped in Charlotte and then Asheville and then have come back to Charlotte for a few months. Over breakfast, we were keen to talk about the challenges we'd faced while unicycle touring. I was particularly interested in how Carrie dealt with the inevitable unplanned dismounts. How often do you fall off yours? Um, I mean, I would say, well on a tour I would say once a week a little one, no. or once every other, and once a week or once every other week. But those are little ones, and then the bigger ones, like hitting the ground and scraping my arms. Um, in twenty thousand miles, I did probably five or eight times. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty similar. I think I've done it like three. Yeah. Trip, where, where I've actually had to use my arms to save me. Mm. But I think yeah, it's pretty similar actually. Yeah, I, I thought I thought that was unusual that well, it came off so much. But it's probably no, about it's once. Just... It's probably about once a week for me as well. Where you just hit something and you just you, yeah. some, suddenly you're just running. That's what it like, is. Oh, when okay. you don't expect it, yeah. then that's it happens because the wheel it's not designed to be. It's just one wheel. <laughs> like it's, <laughs> no I, shit. I, I know. I, it's like I feel like I have to remind people of that. But it should have come as no surprise. But the longer we spoke, the more similarities we found between our trips. This couldn't have been more true of bodging broken unicycle parts. In all of Central and all in Latin, all Latin America, there's one major unicycle distributor, which is right. Unicycle.com uh, Latin America, which is in Costa Rica. And I happened to be breaking my spokes and tying them together with wire, just like that, a day and a half outside of San Jose, yeah. the capital of Costa Rica. And uh, yeah, I used I stayed with these people, and and you know they they didn't care. They weren't cyclists. They were like, just use this wire, like just. And he was like wrapping it up and like tying it. And, and when he did that, I think I had four missing. But by the time I got there, I think I had those four that were wrapped in wire and then maybe two or two or four more. Yeah. And I, it just was kind of like riding like, <laughs> like a flat tire. So how long did your different parts last, I guess? Uh, so I'm on the second wheel because I busted the flange when I was in Kazakhstan. Really? Yeah, it was the... You mean the um, holes for the spokes? Yeah, it was yeah. the hub, you know. The, yeah. the, 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 the spokes were just pulling through because there was no holes to keep them. Uh, but I found a similar guy that, that did an amazing fix. He spent like five hours fixing the actual flange. Fixing the flange because it was an it, it was the it was the Nimbus alloy one. Oh, okay. Which yeah. is crap. It's a, yeah. it's a crap hub. Sorry, Nimbus. <laughs> no, the steel one's done well. The steel, yeah. steel ones. 
Steel ones lasted me two years. Yeah. <laughs> but the, the Chris Holm chromium plated yeah. steel. Or but, chrom- yeah. but the alloy one, you can't weld it. Uh, so this guy, he he he, um, he drilled extra holes at the part of the flange that was still existing uh-huh. and made these little metal, uh, little steel plates, uh-huh. which he then drilled the like, new holes, holes uh, into. Yeah. It, so he cut the flange sh- sh- a little short. So that when he put the steel plate on, it was able to... Yeah, and it was incredible. When I rolled back into Kyrgyzstan, yeah. I had three original spokes. The rest were held on with wire and... Oh my god. So there was three in, the, ori- a- there was three in the original holes. <laughs> it's hilarious how, how fucking <laughs> similar, similar the experiences are. I guess just because based on the technology. And I thought, I thought the parts I had were, were that much better, but I guess but, not. Harry was here in North Carolina for work. He'd been commissioned to paint a mural, so the next morning we packed up our unis and made the short trip to Carrie's water tank. Charlotte Water and I talked about the different ideas that they had uh, one was a process diagram, which they might do later. It's like shows every step in the process. And then the other idea was just pick a tank and show what it does. So this, um, even though part of it's covered, this is a secondary clarifier. So it's kind of the second step. I don't think it's the actually second step, but it's the second big step in the process. Um, the garbage and stuff has been removed, but there's still solids, you know, from uh, human waste and uh, whatnot. So you can see this big thing actually spins around. Uh, the idea is that any tours, any tours that come through here, kids, elementary school kids, whatever, they can, at a glance, they can see what's, what's happening inside the tank instead of just looking at the side of a giant concrete tank and wondering, you know. The murals for educational purposes also to beautify, beautify the property a little bit. I mean, you know, the grass and trees are nice, but it's basically cement, just a bunch of cement. So they wanted to color, color up the cement a bit. And uh, how many days have you been working on, on this so far? Uh, this is my eighth day, but that makes it sound like, I mean, those, those are 13 hour days, 12, 13 hour days. So, yeah. And how much longer do you think you've got to go? Uh, at least four, five, maybe six more days. Yeah. Too soon, I need to leave Charlotte and say goodbye to Carrie. But before then, I was keen to ask him one last question. A question I've personally been asked countless times on my ride. Why do it on a unicycle? If you're gonna do something like this, you know, running is just way over the top and uh, driving is a different thing entirely, but biking, yeah, that's good. And I wanted to do that originally. Actually, I wanted to bike to South America, but um, the same reason any other bicyclist wants to tour is they wanna uh, experience the places, you know, full on, you know, the temperature, the climate, the bugs, the animals, the camping, the uh, challenges of finding water and food and stuff. And then um, there's just something prideful in a good way. There's something that makes you proud about looking on a map and saying, oh yeah, yeah. I, like you can look at a globe and, and trace your finger along it. Uh, and I mean, you and a handful of other people. Well, now it's becoming more popular with bicyclists and even unicyclists. But, um, but it's a select group of people who have gone far enough to then be able to look at a map and trace their finger, so. I was really happy that mine and Carrie's routes had finally intersected, and I left Charlotte feeling motivated to continue tracing my own finger across the globe. If you're curious to see what Carrie's up to now, and perhaps see his finished mural, I've left links to all his stuff down in the description. As for me, I still had 800 miles to ride, and less than a month of my visa to do it in, and with the humidity here really starting to take its toll, this last section of my tour was not gonna be easy. So I pushed onwards, my sights now firmly set on reaching my next big city, Washington DC. But little did I know the shock I'd received soon after arriving in the USA's capital. What the? <laughs> but to find out the culprit of this surprise, you'll have to tune in next time. If you're feeling impatient and can't wait for next week's video, you're in luck, because the next episode is available right now on my Patreon. 
And if you're feeling really impatient, you can head over to Vimeo and watch the entire Ed Unicycles the USA series from start to finish over there. Your support is greatly appreciated. Well, this old thing ain't built for speed, but I love my trusty dusty feet. It'll get me around the world soon, then I'll try to fool. I know my route is roundabout, but I sure as hell don't have a doubt. It'll get me where I'm going as long as the wind is blowing. I'm well aware of dangers out there, and it's not that I don't care.